60 foot drop, 80 to 90 foot drop from the street to the riverbed of the Trinity. So the task is to mitigate a way to traverse that drop and also have a library and get from one place to the other and still have a good space for the city. Uh, I'll jump into, is there a way to share my screen? Oh, here we go. Yeah. Yeah, there is. Pokemon Tristy. What to do, little it. T? Oh. Lil T, this it's is my boy, Berkeley. Berkeley's in the middle of the presentation, so give him just a minute. You go for it, Burke. You guys seeing this? Uh, we are. Here, let me let me watch stream. Uh, I'm getting you pulled up right now, Berkeley. One second. Great. All right, fire away, Berkeley. I see the presentation. Uh, Great. So this is kind of just a first pass. Right so here you can one see second. this is the TCC All site, right, fire away, and Berkeley. here's the Trinity River. And so this one was so kind, this of kind of just a circle that right now, Berkeley. Here I had. See, this is the and I was kind of using right, the here's form the of river, river or something. And so water this one was kind of just more of a circle that right now, Berkeley. Here I had. See, this is the and I was kind of just kind of like these could be pathways or buildings or spaces that move through, and you can circulate through them and kind of move up or down through the site. And these were kind of meant to act as like grid lines that could determine where the river curves. But this is just a first pass at it. This is a more refined take on it. So these kind of imitate a form of a river in some way, and they act as like grid lines. So the swells of each section of these uh, streams, if you call them, kind of is determined by where these uh, horizontal bands come. So it's kind of horizontal rivers kind of defining a larger river to navigate through. And so here's a model or a final-ish model that we made a few weeks ago. So the site is terraformed so that it's stepped in the way that I had in this previous drawing with the green strips. And it's kind of these curving wall forms that, that like direct you through the site. But I wanted it to be ambiguous in a way so that you could use this as the building or this could be the site you inhabit or it could be in this area as well. So I kind of wanted to keep it ambiguous so that you could have access to multiple areas on this site. And here's just a few more pictures of this model. And then here's just some models we had. So here on the left is kind of the progress of it so far. So it started with this sort of 2D uh, version of this white one at the bottom. And so something I took from this first model I made is it needed to be more three-dimensional. So I started to create walls out of the ground and try to expand it vertically. And now I'm also trying to carve into the ground and make spaces uh, into the ground so that it's both acting vertically and into the ground so that you have two areas of interaction on the site. And then uh, let me show you, are you guys seeing the screen as well on Rhino? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so here's a first pass at it in Rhino. So these red spaces are kind of carving into the ground. And these are the blue are sort of walls. So if you see here, it's kind of, uh, we have these spaces that are kind of flat carving into the landscape. And these walls are kind of defining, like cutting into spaces, making areas where you can inhabit. Something for this phase of the design is Chase wanted us to create a space for an amphitheater of 5,000 people just to have a large gathering space. That's not part of the program for the final project, but just for this. Uh, design mm -hmm. exercise. So I use this bottom space towards the river to be kind of the amphitheater. So this main area can be like a gathering space and you could circulate through here. And then these tiers are like how an amphitheater would work as like a theater in some way. Berkeley, am I understanding correctly about... that this is just all site work essentially at the moment? Yes, this is mostly site work. We have okay. just barely started doing buildings. So most of this is more conceptual at the moment. Okay. And uh, Something I also try to do is create spaces where you could interact throughout these weaving bands on the site. So there's holes throughout each of these walls where you can kind of move through and circulate better just to kind of create more flow between the two forms. And then what I was working on recently was uh, trying to make it feel more natural because in this one, there's still a few curves and edges that are like, like here. This doesn't feel natural. It feels kind of man-made. So I tried uh, using circles to kind of define the entire shape of the area, and it's given it a more, it feels like I'm looking at bubbles now, which could be good or bad, but it's just something I was experimenting with to kind of just move the process along. 
And so here's how it kind of looks now. This is a work in progress, of course, but this is kind of just uh, uh, extruding this version and making it more three-dimensional. And yeah, that's, that's what I got so far. So thank you guys. Thank you, thank you. Would you um, would you actually mind bringing your stream back up and just kind of like slowly going yeah, get the stream through the up. images? You don't you don't have to talk over more. I just want to kind of keep eyes on the them. rhino ones. Uh, uh, your two D ones were nice too. Yeah, the two D ones. Your figure ones. Gowns. Okay. My first question, design wise, yeah. you started off very organic, very natural, very flow. And then you make this decision to go more structured with the bubbles and the less organic shade. I mean, a bubble is kind of organic, but not really, you know, it's like, um, so why was, th what informed that choice? That was um sort of a critique I received from Chiesa. He said I should try to come up with a way to make it feel more uh, organized because he mm, said the yeah. the spaces felt random, which I thought kind of made it successful in a way. Mm. But um, like these were this was all done in Illustrator, so these were all random and just trying to make bends and curves like a river does. And I thought right. that was it successful. But well, he Bert said I should try. To the, the bends and curve of a river are dictated by the topography more often than not, which I think is my main uh, consideration is, is that when you told me you have this really unique site that's going to slope 70 to 80 feet, I kind of forget your exact number. My first thought is always, how do you use that hill to your advantage? Um, do you want to cantilever out from it and let it drop below your building? Do you want to carve into it? Um, a lot of this can be controlled by, you know, stun studies. I think if you want to go the water route, I think you try to... Uh, and I know you've already visited the site, but understand how would the water even get down to the river where it's going to dump into, and then allowing uh, allowing almost as if you were to pour a water tower down this slope, where would the water slope down? And then letting that be the info like it's like you're turning your irrigation into as a, you're turning your irrigation that's going to have to be a part of any successful building project into a into like the one of the principal design elements of it is to say. I didn't just want to drain the site to make it functional. I wanted to use the drainage of the site as a, because it's interesting too, that you were trying to go for this natural look, but you still have a symmetrical datum line down the middle to where you're draining the whole thing down mm. what looks to be essentially the center of your site. And then that also might be going why you're kind of creating this architectural symmetry, but also trying to say it's going to be natural and nature oftentimes is more is asymmetrical more often than it is symmetrical. I, th I think that that's a really. Received, a... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I did receive a critique from we had like a informal review with uh, Mason and Ricardo Munoz a few weeks mm -hmm. ago, and Munoz suggested it, he said I should design with the thought of uh, how kind of what you said, Brady, of how water flows naturally. So when it's yeah. on a steeper slope, usually water just runs straight down the slope. It's only when it's on a flat yep. surface where it really tends to bend and weave. So I tried to do some uh, iterations with that idea, and I'm still kind of trying to figure out how I can incorporate that idea into something like this, with still interesting. Because really you're almost playing landscape architect to a degree here now too, to where it's like, yeah. if you're going to do the straight line, it's like how do I make that a, a water feature almost, or like you can almost start to terrace the land and know that like, hey, it's going to go down this pathway that I planned for it. I know it's going to be a straight line, but I'm going to make it terrace so it stacks down. And now I've got this waterfall effect going all the way down to the river. And then you can let that waterfall effect somehow be a central design datum for your library or amphitheater that you end up designing with. But then you're going to get very French almost and landscape oriented. Um, but sorry, uh, Ryan, I think you had an idea as well. Well, it's 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 kind of rolling off of yours a little bit. Um, but earlier, when I first saw this, um, I don't know if I missed it or not. But the green the green lines are those determined by the contours of the site. Um, no, I kind of 
terraform the site in my own way because this time it was all super conceptual. Mm -hmm. So the green lines are kind of meant to be just <clears throat> steps down on the site. So this is one level and then another one steps down. So they're kind of just like an organizational step down to the site versus between like these two green lines is where most of the site is sloping because this is just a flat parking lot at the moment. Oh. So I think I think there's kind of a way you can marry a few things in this to make this concept really strong. Um, I think the notion that you're talking about with it being the water kind of flowing down, and the reason I say this goes right in line with what you're thinking, Brady, is I think a stronger study of the actual contours of the site would give you some insight to how the water might move through this, right? But then on top of it, I think you can marry it over to like user circulation in a sense where you can study how they would move to the different programmatic elements within your site and you can kind of mark landscape by water movement and pedestrian circulation another way and then you start to get to the play of these lines as they kind of come together okay but i also liked i think you made an argument early on kind of a figure ground argument of saying there's two ways to read my site. You know, I have space and mass where I have mass and space. Um, and I think you did this with one of your other images. Could you maybe go to one of your model images too? Oh, this is top down. And I think what, another question you need to be prepared for too, Berkeley, is just like, when you kind of have these, I'm gonna call them arbitrary for now. I, I'm, I imagine you have something gauging your decision of those horizontal lines you have kind of running across the site. Um, first, why, do they, why are they curved if they're grid lines? And second, how did you go about placing them? Um, would be would be two questions I would have. I think you should be prepared to answer for a reviewer of just like what was your rationale in placing those green lines and how do they come to be? Okay. And then now I'm also posing those questions to you if you if you have an answer to them or oh. if they were just truly organizational devices for you to help conceptualize the site. That's also an answer too. Yeah, uh, the green. It really started off as like an abstraction of the river with this top one, and then I kind of just moved it down to create an adequate amount of space to create one of those swells with these pads. So they're placed sort somewhat randomly, but also in a way so that there's plenty of space between each one to create spaces for people to inhabit as well. Mm -hmm. so they were used organizationally, but also in a design way as well. Yeah, I would probably add to that arguing to more proportionalize out the site for easier circulation or something like that because i mean some professors love randomness but most if you start off that answer oh yeah i just like randomly placed them they'll like hit the eject button immediately yeah, they go wild. Uh, Bert, let me ask you, because I kind of, forgive me for coming in late. Uh, what's like the, the program of this mm. project? Oh, uh, so it's a new central library for the city of Fort Worth. Oh. And this is the site here. This is the TCC campus in downtown Fort Worth and the Trinity River. And then this will be a Panther Island. If any of y'all know about yeah. that project. Yeah. Have... Okay, and right now so, you guys are in early development, just looking at the site and laying out the site. This past week, it was kind of a starting on the building or designing a building and plans, but it was also make a 40 inch by 40 inch concept model with the class. So models took a little bit of precedent over design at the moment. Yeah, I've always kind of enjoyed models over design. I find that in building and, and investigating the model, you learn a lot about what your design should be. Um, You've gone to site, which is nice. Have you? Uh, I guess this is all the way in Fort Worth. This isn't necessarily too close to you, but it's not too far. Um, I'm just thinking out loud here. Berkeley, would you go? I think you had some other images too. Would you kind of keep scrolling through the images you have at your ready? So I think I'm still trying to understand. So these these swells, as you're calling them. So right now we're just purely. We can we can kick it here too, or or maybe go back one so I can kind of see back one more so I can see the yeah, this guy, these swells you're having. I'm curious because mm -hmm. I think this is maybe what's confusing some of your logic because you're saying I want this natural shape, but then you're imposing on it this kind of 
uh, formality, which is just kind of this curvilinear form that nature wouldn't follow. Because to your point, you said, if it goes straight down the hill, it's going to be in a linear line. And it's going to kind of kind of snowball down the hill and, and carve out essentially a valley until it's a valley. Um, and I think this is what you're doing now and trying to put in the circles and try to impose a structure on this kind of freelance grid you've created for yourself. And now you're trying to structure it. So what, maybe what brought you to this form or, or how did you get to these? What made you think I want three swells? What's the advantage of this to you on your site that you're trying to then take advantage of when you put a building on it? Well, with the three swells, it was more of a way to get people through the site. So the one in the middle is a uh, main street in Fort Worth, which would connect directly with the site. The one mm -hmm. on the left, there's a, it's not a major entrance, but it's a big entrance to the TCC campus right next to it. So that can be ah, great, great, great. There. And then on this side, there's uh, up and coming apartments and mid rises that are going to be there. Beautiful. No, the, this great actually answer. answers a lot. Yeah, of perfect questions. answer. Because now yeah. you're now you're tying your project into the surrounding context, and professors are going to geek over that. So that answer in of itself is something I think you should bring up into saying, "Hey, I have these, I have these three pathways, and these pathways all serve a function, and it's to tie in and connect the surrounding architecture and become it not just an architecture of this one place, but become an architecture of this area that's not just serving." The site isn't self-serving; it's actually serving the community, and I think that's that's a, a a great design ethos, and then it's also a great logic for you to justify the decisions you've made. Okay, good, good to know. I'm so sure. maybe maybe I can help you tie in your green uh, the swales that you were talking about and give them a little bit more justification. So um, I'm actually. I wish I could draw like uh, like Microsoft Teams lets you do or Zoom, but uh, so looking at your so your site has like this, um, it's still kind of orthographic even though you have the wavy uh, the contours because you have these two directions that are going on, uh, which you mm -hmm. clearly label as the green and the blue. Uh, it's like the direction of the green. I, I kind of like this tiered um system that you have it it sets it up to uh, to conform with a like an elevated site like a, a descending site it gives you places to to i guess like cut the the ground and then uh, form like a terrace um the question is like where those like the start and the end of those green uh swales i feel like if you take cues from what's going on next to the building and on the other side i know there's not too much to work with um but even like where um i can't really draw on it but that that college building uh, on the left there like the south end of it where it's kind of ending and then it looks like maybe there's some plaza thing happening like it and it looks like you already have the green kind of starting there but it's like finding these little uh, you're finding like the pinpoint moments on the end of the site where you maybe want to connect it more and bring in whether the the green swells like a pathway or um, or a border or something like that. But uh, picking up on like what's around the site would would help you there. And so okay. let me ask you the the blue um, is that setting up like a landscape feature or is it setting up the building? walls or the location of it or something at this time of kind of design it was really conceptual and we were told don't even think about a building think about just the ground <laughs> classic so this was kind of just like how i was going to play with the ground so i was planning to like carve into the ground and so like for was it like for this one like this outer shape would be like where the walls are now and then each one of these like inner bands could be a different tiered level inside that wall, which is kind of what I tried to do in the Rhino model. But I just kind of uh, took some of those levels out because we got too chaotic and there was no space for like actual circulation. Sure. Yeah, I think you picked the right strategy for placing those as well, especially that central like axis. Because this site right now, I'm looking at it, it's like a parking lot. 
with some kind of like yeah. central driveway, but it it is uh perfectly in line with you said Main Street. It's probably a pretty important mm-hmm. street. It is. Um well, it's the main one. <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering if yeah. I'm wondering if uh like how much y'all are gonna cut into this um uh, the the green the trees and everything like north of the site because usually uh, like in real life like you would like you wouldn't even be able to build on top of it did uh yeah. did your professor like uh tell y'all about like uh what is it called guys help me out it's the uh if you're about uh, to get wetlands the coast, just drop the wetlands it. yeah no no just just let it go we're gonna let that rip well i mean that's about. like a serious thing it's not even like a infrastructural thing it's like preserving wetlands to just for the fact of preserving trees um i mean i hear you on that and if it was more so you're just landscaping into it if it was professional i'd be with you 100 percent. but i just think i find that trying to make a professional argument on a collegiate project is honestly just going to make professors upset at you because then they're going to start looking at the actual practicality of your project and then they're going to be like well that's not economical and that's not a real design feature and you're not in code on your parking and so then you're just going to get into the can of worms of like, <laughs> A, they've asked them to take a theoretical approach. They've asked them to not even consider the building and the abstraction of designing the site. So if you're going to turn around and go, well, there's a land, there's code against developing wetlands, Kies is going to have an aneurysm because he's not asking them to do like a building code analysis. Isn't and that's, he the I don't one know, that's who's my take on it. Super, um, he's super about the, uh, what do you call it? The water shedding and... I don't know. He, I feel like I've always heard him trying to make cases for protecting the wildlife as much as possible. But, right. Uh, he, but he hasn't mentioned any of that so far. He's like, we've been okay. like completely. So, the site. so in these like, studios where they do try and give you as much freedom as possible, I, I find it better if I put uh, limitations mm. on myself. And yeah, that's true. If you did, if you were looking for some kind of limitations, because that's a hard thing to do when you're given so much freedom and you don't, you know, they don't help try and help you find any of this. It is like a logical uh, parameter to say that you have to have like these wetlands preserved. Um, but at the same time, I don't know if you wanted to show off and look a little bit more professional. The wetlands is like a thing that lots of projects uh have to deal with right and um it's not always like a bad thing i mean imagine if you preserve this this width of trees you kind of bisect the site you say all right i'm gonna touch the north as least as i can as as whatever the um the term is you you know like try and stay away from that as much as you can and you give that south portion like more architectural attention it's not saying you can't do anything with the trees, but um, maybe that's just a landscaping thing that, that comes after the fact of the actual building. Yeah. But yeah, it's hard whenever they don't like, they don't give you anything to kind of work off of. You, you have to set it for yourself, I think. I, I think having consideration for something like the forest structure there for preservation is maybe just kind of part of good site analysis as well right yeah. like being able to say like i don't need to tear all this down i can interact with this that is i think a way of marketing mm-hmm. that thought of like you want to engage with those things mm-hmm. without bringing it all the way back to like code Great point. The project right yep yeah and w- one w- way t- to put potentially solve that without even changing this design is you can stop the main interaction at that third green vine, and then you can even keep those trees and have the blue intersect with it. And then that vast green band could even be elevated or within the trees you know or what have you because also it can more integrate with that space instead of like all 
or nothing. Because is there a pathway on the river? Like, is that what everyone's trying to get to, yeah. essentially? You know, yeah. so, yeah. That's what this is here. Yeah, and... Kiesa mm -hmm. uh, also mentioned, like, in this I design room, like, Panther Island would be done, or it's in the process of being done. So, he's mm. like, if you could connect to the river from both Panther Island and from the city, it would be ideal. So, you can have the library as, like, a central hub for people right. coming from the river and from downtown, kind of meet there. Have you so thought about adding like a bridge? bridge? That's pretty strange for me because Panther Islands are going to be a party place and you're trying to design a library, but all the same, that's pretty tight. What is Panther Island? It's just a program. Island. Something that is like new. No, no, it's in Fort Worth. Or it's Fort a, Worth. It's a Fort Worth attraction. It's kind of like they host parties there. It's the place you can go float the river. Um, I think they have beer trucks and food trucks out there. I think. I've actually brewery, never gone right? out there. First, a live music pavilion, yeah. They use it as a live music pavilion, and then you can go and bring, like, floaties and watch them perform, and then you can sit out on the river. So is it basically for... just that area just a river? The Panther Island? Yeah, so there's actually been a, a push to, like, redesign the area. It's the north side of Fort Worth, and it's like uh, they're basically going to divert the river through this new island in there. There's going to be new developments and stores and stuff, so it's going to be a whole new area versus just like a place to go watch concerts. So they're oh well, that's cool then. Redesigning the whole north side of Fort Worth, basically. So it's going to be a whole new up and coming area. Okay. If it ever gets approved, because they've been trying to do it for thirty years now. So. so that's fair. In your project, are you supposed to be interacting with Panther Island? Um, he said it's you could like have the opportunity to do it to do that would be great. So like, don't completely close yourself off from the river. So like, make it equal access. So it'd be exciting to enter from the river or from. Uh, oh the wow! So, There's some images that uh, Ryan just posted in the chat. They're pretty sick. So are they Can saying that this project should? It will eventually become a building, a library going to go right on top of this site or is it going to be is it going to be somewhere it'll else be, uh, right on top of the site on top it'll of the site in the same, yeah it'll be in the same space i do okay. on top of it and also in the site so that it's like uh, in the ground because he's been trying to encourage playing with the ground and the landscape as much as he can so it feels cohesive with it and that's and that's always going to be kind of the task too, Berkeley. Especially when they give you hill sites. Um, basically, what they're going to want to see is some type of carved element, which is going to be the amphitheater element you're explaining. And then, honestly, anytime I get a hill, it always lends itself so well to a cantilever element, to where you know the the library is kind of soaring above this landscape. You're going to pull people underneath that cantilever to kind of see the marvel of whatever formal expression you want to take up there. And then, but it seems like at this point, I think I think now we're understanding your rationale. Of essentially, you have you have these four terraces um, orthogonally bisected by three levels of circulation. I think what might be stronger is to tie the two outer two into the middle one, and it gets kind of back to Monty's point of you know pull pull the three outer ones back to so if if that central one is the most important one, it's where you're going to spend all your money. It's where you're going to spend all the effort and time it's like pull those other two that are connecting tcc and the side street like at your third green line pull them towards that almost like a bottleneck to where they all come to this one central location to follow on that datum and to really emphasize like these these outer pathways are just auxiliary pathways to help with flow but they're really all trying to get to this main vein that you're creating this datum point that's going to run down the circulate like the main circulation of the site is hierarchically down the center and that's my most important one. And But I've given the TCC students and I've given the city these auxiliary sites, which are your outer ones. Um, and that's just one thought I have is like, would it be a stronger design ethos to connect them all to that main vein? And then to show people like I've I've spent all my money, I've, I've made my client design this incredible circulation corridor that's going to interact really well with my building, as opposed to kind of 
dividing your site into essentially twos with with pathways on each side, and, and that might help you create a more uh, a, a less kind of just like divided because it's kind of like you have your your layers right now. You have your four greens and your three blues, and, and then nothing's really cohesively tying into one another. Um, except for at the ends, it's like, okay, I'm dropping, the blues are dropping you off at one green line and at the end of the green line, but how do the blues interact? It's like those circulation corridors don't interact. So if I'm in the middle and I take a wrong path, it's like, oh, how do I get to TCC? It's like, oh, I need to go back to a green line over to my blue line and then I can get back to school. So I think maybe another iteration is is like, how do you make your three blues interact with each other to maybe get back to a central, get back to your central datum is, is one thought I'm kind of having now too. Can we see the final the, the beginning started to Oh yeah, in the uh, right above. Yeah. So it's uh this year. It's kind of what I've been experimenting with the past few days. Where it's the circles kind of more defining the shape versus this kind of shape that I picked out instead. Okay. Because I don't, are you intending for these flows to look? Um, they're gonna be made to look natural, like a river, or is it gonna be like man-made, where it could look at that point, why and falls? They see rivers. Like, <laughs> uh, the idea from the start was to kind of make it feel and look like a river, and kind of take. Because it's right on the river, so kind of taking that idea and abstracting it to the land. But I feel like this one is starting to feel less organic and more man-made than it was in the past, like this. Is that closer or farther to or from your party? This one? Yeah. I think this is farther from my part see. This is pretty similar to where it started. This kind of, uh, from what Brady was just saying, kind of combining the spaces together. I removed that third one. I kind of combined the left one and the central one into one. But this one feels totally different from what I've been doing so far. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, I've been doubting it kind of today, just uh, how successful it actually is for what I'm trying to achieve. Well, then think, th th help us think through what was the, anytime someone kind of gives me their parameters or their, their guidelines for design, I kind of like to know what brought them there. So for instance, the circle, why is kind of each circle, why is each circle size the way it is kind of what was your, because at that point you almost want to get into, it, it almost looks like you're trying to draw Lake Corbusier's man in a way, or what you're searching for is a proportion system that will help you make informed decisions about how, how big and small to make things, which is kind of what you're going for with a conceptual site. Well, it's a real site with a conceptual or an abstract concept imposed on the site. So it's like, well, to Tristan's point, how do you start to give yourself rules to understand what it is that you're wanting to design? And then even more clearly, tell other designers, I've, I've designed this way because of these rules I've imposed on myself for this site. And, and, and to Tristan's point, it's, it's good to impose rules because if you don't, you're just kind of a, a free floating amoeba and you're just trying to say, because what, what eventually your argument's always gonna boil down to if you don't kind of impose rules or, or parameters is you're gonna end up saying like, I designed it this way because I thought it was cool. And you're gonna say that to some former extent. And that just makes it so, I mean, it's all subjective of course, but usually what I find when, when I'm presenting to professors, I try to come up with, you know, my party, my design thesis. And in, in this instance, it sounds like you're trying to go with, um, I wanted my site to, I wanted my site to allow for the natural effects that would happen on it if a building wasn't built to occur, but also impose a built programmed structure onto the site. Um, and, and that kind of seems to be what your thesis is for this project of saying like, I let the site do what it needed to do by nature, and I let the building work in conjunction with that ideology. And then I've also carved out these spaces in my site that also are natural and, and, and create an element of, I use the site to create the programs, and then the programs found their way within the site, if that makes any sense. So I guess what my challenge to you would be formulate your thesis 
and then make sure that all your design decisions and, and the language you're using to explain your design are supporting that thesis. At, at our firm, we call that uh, design drivers. And it's always the first thing that you come up with for a project, which is weird that the, your professors are pushing you to just come up with these like abstract shapes, like your shape making before you even really know what your goals are. Uh, and I mean, I don't know everything about the project, but I feel like that's where you should start. It's, it's more of like a, um, you kind of have to get away from the visual. I mean, of course you can't for, for your deliverables for a studio, but like in your design process, I feel like you, you have to get away from the visual and you have to start with um, like the verbal, like what can you list about the site that, that gives you things to work with and will drive your design. That's what the design drivers are. Um, and then every decision, you, like Brady said, every decision you go with moving forward, it, it'll play to one of those design drivers. And if it doesn't, and you really feel strongly about it, add that to your list of design drivers. Um, so like, me looking at this site, let me share my screen real quick. Uh, Google Earth is an amazing tool. Um, can you guys see this? Sweet. Um, hold on, let me pull you up. It is quite sloped. Yeah, I mean, just look at this. Uh, the way the site currently is, and of course you guys don't have to go by that because um, Ideally, you'll manipulate whatever you need, but like the site is like this podium, oh, this podium, um, like overlooking this tree line. So already you have like this natural bisection of the whole site. Um, whether or not you want your library to like get into the, you know, into the trees, um, if there's a way to, I mean, this building kind of sets a precedent for like. Yeah, that was going to be my next thought. It's like you have a neighbor making decisions, so now you have a, a clear choice to make too, Berkeley. It's like, do I take the language my neighbor's using and start to reinforce it and create a architecture that has kind of like an architecture that cooperates? Or am I going to say like, no, my building, the public library of Fort Worth is a special building and it deserves it deserves to break the contextual mold around it. Um, and that's kind of like, do you want to be like, Frank Gehry, or do you want to design like a Le Corbusier-esque of like, like, do you want, do you want to consider, and you could do either one. It's kind of however you want to justify it. You could say both. You could say, hey, I use TCC's language and I use the decisions of these architects to inform my decisions about the site and then to create these formal shapes that also cooperate with my neighbors. Or you can just say, if they ask you, no, my building is special and it deserves to be treated as such. And that way it's like, I reject, or just to say like, my building is special and the program is, is for Fort Worth and it didn't need to necessarily take its cues from the, the architecture next door. And then either one of those decisions, I think presenting that to pre, uh, presenters or, or to your jury is going to be a strong case of just saying like, uh, I decided to take, I always found taking context and taking precedent from the things around me won me points over with my professors. Um, Especially if you're finding ways to play into it, which it kind of seems like you are, at least in your context of saying like, hey, because that would be my thing to consider is you're saying with your with your site design, you're saying. I am creating these corridors, I have my main datum that's for just my site, and then I have these two auxiliary datums or these two uh, circulation pathways that are tying the side street and the, and the campus into my site. So if that's going to be kind of your design ethos. I think it would be smart for you to reiterate that in even your building of saying like, uh, you don't have an next door neighbor to your right, but to saying like, oh, I'm going to use similar materials as the TCC campus. I'm all, cause you can kind of see automatically what, what, what should be, or what I think a lot of architects would think to do at this site of saying like, I'm going to project my building out of the cliff and then my views are going to be directed over the Trinity. It's a, it's, it seems to be what the site is lending because anytime you have that sloped hill, you're going to push your building out, drop the structure below, and then face your views to any water feature. That would be um, a damn good rendering, too. Boom. Boom. Thank you for pulling up the Google Earth, because I feel like seeing... This is the best definitely... architect tool ever. 
Yeah, it definitely yeah. changed my opinion of how I see this site. I feel like this site has a lot of potential. Potential to have fun with. Yeah, this is a great site. So, Tristan, you um brought up something that I've been kind of thinking on for a minute. So I, I sketched a little bit out of your site plan a little bit earlier. Hey. Uh, it's kind of hard to see. But the things that Tristan pointed out, like you've got that kind of hatch zone there. That's your parking podium right now, right? Yeah. That orange area is your slope. So really like that hatched area is your kind of prime area for excavation right now, right? Because once you get into those trees, it's going to be a massive pain in the ass. And you don't want to take all those trees out either, right? Especially in a site like this where like you're going to be fighting through the side of that hill the entire time. So, you know, I, I go back to kind of your earlier move with wanting to identify the path of the water going through your site, right? Mm -hmm. And the thing you did early on is you essentially were making an abstract attempt at identifying the vectors of the water flow. Right. Is that an accurate way to kind of summarize yeah. that? Yeah. So I think if in your Rhino model, you were showing some terrain in here, is that the actual terrain or is that one that you've kind of sculpted out? That's the actual terrain. Like that's how. Okay. Such. So I think, I can... <clears throat> yeah, if you can, if you can yeah, bring it back up. up. Pull it up, Jamie. This is the, the actual topography of the site. Okay, awesome. Um, I think one thing you might do then to continue off of your part T is study the contours of this and start to notice when they kind of come together and clasp to form those little valleys and ridges that run through the hill where the water starts to go. Right, right. The thing about those vectors is it's pretty easy to predict where they're going to continue onward if we don't intervene right because they're just going to keep going back and away from it until something opens up because it loses the pressure to hold it together when you take that and you expand it through the flat portion of your site i think you have an opportunity to then say okay these are the zones i know water would start to go through i don't want to put people in those zones right because once we start doing that that's when we start running into water mitigation issues because we know the water is going in those spots. That's going to be a more difficult area for us to build. So you start to move away from the zones and those become your landscape pieces. You can start to identify program and sizing and everything else in the spaces that you want to avoid then, right? And kind of play off of each other in that way. Okay. And also to add on to that, in viewing that landscape, it would probably swell pretty heavily where that parking lot is now and then basically st st streamline down that hill and not to change up everything formally because also you can push and pull forever. But if the main part T is what happens with the water on the site, it'd be like three main swells at the front close to Main Street and then it would taper down towards the street as well as how is Main Street going to be taken into consideration? Is there going to be a gate, other trees or buildings on the st street to actually preserve Main Street or is it sp supposed to be a boy to pull people in these are points of thought but i i also don't want to ch change up everything formally either because it's your project you know put in that notion of where are those true swells and p pushing it as natural as possible almost because it seems the two are being Thought between the natural and the man made. Well, if this is site work, focus on the n natural, have it flow. And then with the building, you can bring in the more man made features, features because it will inherently look man made. 
that'd be an interesting thought process for the project too i think is just saying like the site work is governed by nature and then the building is an imposition upon my site it's like when i built the building i let i let my building be what it needed to be for the program and the functions of the building to be successful and if for it to be formally celebratory of the of the uh, of the significance of a public library to the community but then you can simplify of when they're like well why did you make these landscape decisions and it's like because and it gets almost into like the Lucan thing. It's like, well, a brick wants to be an arch. And it's like, well, my water wanted to go down that way already. So I just let it go down that way. Like I let right. the site be governed by nature. And then I made my, I made my building an imposition on that nature. Uh, well, the better way. To, Based on the say, use. Or, yeah. My, my site is governed by nature and my building is an imposition on the site. And that's, that's exactly what I mean when I say like, look where that water wants to go, fill in the spots where it doesn't. Right, like that's that's how you can kind of play with that balance and the things that you're already like working towards in here. Right, this would be kind of like the next like advancement as you kind of move through the process, like identify those things and then it helps build those rules and refine for you as well. Uh, can I can I ask a question about how you're modeling the walls on this? Uh, sure. What uh what is your process for sculpting those at the moment? Uh, so um, it starts. It's never fun when you start with a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> It started as a Brady pen, special. originally it began in Illustrator, so I okay. exported a DWG into Rhino, some lines, put them on layers, and then so I have these 2D lines, and then they kind of just, I extrude the surface so that it's cutting into the topo, and then I just Boolean difference that so that it's just on top of the topo and not like cutting into it still. And then I'll take, uh, this one I just used like, a curved polyline and kind of went from a side view and cut horizontally, I guess. So like I had big polyline and then just extruded it across the site and then trimmed the walls through that polyline or curve extrusion. Gotcha. Okay. Side note for the podcast, whenever I think it would be cool is like when, since Berkeley just brought up these two technical terms, we do a clip of like Boolean difference. And then it's like the command and then what the command does. And then we says polyline, yeah. polyline, what the Maybe. command is and what the command does. That'd be good. That's for people. Yeah. But anyhow, uh, that'll be more of an editing thing, but making thing for later. Um, so I think with building these walls out in an intentional fashion, it would be beneficial to work against your topography kind of three-dimensionally it's going to mentally sound like a pain in the ass but if you can kind of identify like points along the topography and just draw a line up to where you want that wall to exist then you can vertically draw that curve offset that and then sweep it and it'll give you much more friendly geometry to work with where you'll be able to go and you'll just be able to grab points and then any tweaks you need to make after the fact you can just grab the points adjust and pull as you're working through it still rather than having to kind of like go in and rebuild and re-slice and stuff like that. Okay. Sounds like it would be actually easier than web too. So it, it it should it should make things a little bit easier on you. Um do you use the interp uh, interpolate curve command? Interpret command. If uh in your in your right now if you type in I N T curve Yeah, that one there. So that will let you just do it off in space there. Don't do it on any geometry. But that'll let you draw points and control where the curve goes around them. And then you can grab those points individually and adjust. If you use the rebuild command, it will allow you to add more points to that line. But mm -hmm. then that gives you a control, like a curve that you have a high amount of control over. So when you are needing to make these adjustments, you can really finesse it rather than Again, trying to kind of have to like move and cut and work through a lot of different shapes to get something more controllable. Okay. Man, no professor's ever going to give you critiques like that. Oh, they don't give you those. <laughs> no. no. They don't know Rhino well enough to do it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> One thing, uh, Bert. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. You go um, ahead. The So you guys are saying, uh, kind of let the water flow how it would so like on a flat surface it would swell more and on a slope it would come like a straight line down I've, not I've necessarily 
Because if you go look at, for instance, like Yellowstone, Yellowstone has like, it'll zigzag. So water and realisticness or water in nature is going to take the least, the path of least resistance, which is typically straight down. But sometimes that's going to take a left. And once it's carved its lane to the left, it'll keep carving that path of least resistance if it wiggled in the beginning. So I think you can still right. say like, no, no, my, my lines wiggle because, and you can still just say, Hey, I carved this. Like I, I, I found out where the general water wanted to go. And then I carved my wiggle along that line. And now water is going to reiterate that because water takes the path of least resistance. And, and that is a natural term. I was just saying, look, I found where the natural, where the water naturally goes. And then I carved a formal form that I want to celebrate or is central to my design or however you want. However, you want to justify the form you carve, and then just saying now water will follow this curve. I'm just saying like, I, I look naturally where the water wants to go. I made a form, and now the water will follow it because this is the path of least resistance that I've created for the water. So it doesn't have to be straight. Yeah, and if if you're putting these walls along that path, you know, like, like you take the center line of that path of the water and you offset it out like 15 feet on either side. And you draw that wall along it, now it becomes a retaining wall against that water, and now you're encasing your landscape feature. Ooh, right? Good point. Ryan, and I think, really even have to Berkeley, like... correct me if I'm wrong, those walls, or those lines aren't actual walls, they're points of concept, they're, they're ways to understand your conceptual ideas, they're not actually physical walls, am I understanding that correctly? Kind of both, honestly. Okay. Like, at first, okay. there were ways well, then... to love the site, yeah. but as you make them treat it, they become walls. And right. I'm kind of thinking of them as turning. Yeah, into they start to come a lot more mass oriented. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, and I think that's that's like one of those elements elements in architecture where you get to take this like abstract theme and pull it into reality a little bit, right? Yeah. Because now this becomes your your datum, like your representation of this information in physical form, right? Mm -hmm. Because you've now said yeah. this is how this water is moving. I am retaining it with these lines of motion made out of concrete going up the side of this hill. These are the pathways my people will take to get to this fire pit or this amphitheater or whatever else you have kind of programmed throughout the area. And you're pulling that conceptual plane out to say like, okay, I'm marking it. I'm showing exactly like the tectonics. This is where like the wacky architectonic term that gets thrown away everywhere actually comes in. It's like, this is the literal tectonics of the project. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I was. I want to. Could be. Find a. Uh, even if it is like a natural press. So, for example, I keep thinking of slopes and. Thinking of the way. The pattern of trail, and. A lot of times here in trails, there's a, it, it, it sort of is a path of least resistance. Just it is a human trail for people to hike on. They usually follow the topography. For man. Sometimes they don't. And. The safety reason. But that the the path it takes and it doesn't look natural there's a reason why and look into that reason it could be a design well of half is and when you do or the key design choices um you Start to build an argument there of design choices. You when things follow a certain trait and go against it. and looking at that in other projects or out in and start to argument why you So was another thing about the a little bit confused about what the spells really are I know you mentioned that they are for the connecting in that case that that, that reason okay 
Or on that, or on that note, just I, Burke, if I'm understanding correctly, the green is how you're terracing the site, to some degree. Yeah, it's more It'd terracing be, in the blue. It could be cool yeah. to create two models of saying like, here's my green model of just how I plan on terracing the site, and then here's my blue model of how I plan on creating circulation within the site. I think that's probably what you're doing with your final model. Um, actually, I'm, I'm I'm blanking on what your models look like at the moment, but that could be a good exploration too of like. Setting up before you even get to carving your circulation pass or programming your building um, with it with a, just a with a with, which essentially you call it your green model of just saying this is how I'm going to terrace the site and understanding exactly how you're going to do that. But also, if that's not what 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 the deliverables are asking for, then of course put your time on on the deliverables that are being asked for. Yeah. 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 <laughs> also, but also, uh, oh, go ahead, Tristan. The more I look at this site, um, one thing you're going to want to be careful of is thinking about scale. Um, because I'm looking at like the court building that's, what is that, south of your site? And that's like a whole, um, you know, a whole like government building in that one little square block. And like you can imagine a library is maybe around the same size if you're going for a larger library. Um, so mm -hmm. think about like all that program dispersed al along this site. Um, and they, they really did give you a, a big site to work with here. Um, we have a it, trimmed down slightly. So I think most of us in the class for the context model, we're using maybe like three quarters of the whole width of it now. We're not using the full okay. two blocks. But it's okay. still a very big site. You're right. Yeah, right. So, I mean, that preserving that tree line once again might even help you because it just gives you more reason not to go too go large over there. building right right you could um <laughs> easily pull it back and if you are going to keep this size of the site then you have to think how is this building like what happens to the rem remainder of the site and you might just disregard it just to not you know spend the hours designing it and because you know every time is precious in school um but the building could be an opportunity to split the site for you if you're thinking i mean you're you're already making these like linear motions with the blue um so stretching your building program out across the site um lake flato has a good do you have you heard of lake flato before yeah Shut they up. have a good project um can't think of it right now uh, I'll pull it up after I'm done talking, but uh, it's like this, I think it's a visitor center or something, but it's, uh, they, they like take the program of the building and they like string it along this path, this exterior path. Um, and all of the like programs are like in their individual little huts, like oh, wow. along the path. Um, yeah, and it's in a climate that like works really well with that. But what money? Yeah, the climate's crucial, but that could also be a great built precedent and then put that in with the stream idea because it being linear kind of calls for that kind of organization. Yeah, I mean, and I'm not Texas trying to though, tell so you. Inside. Right, right. You... Yeah, I'm not trying to tell you like what to do with your project or how to design it, but thinking about the scale of the site and the way that you are notioning like moving through down the hill and to the river. Cause it's kind of the way I see this project is you want to get people from the city to the river in a natural way. And your library is going to be like the vehicle to do that. Uh, and you want your site to be well-designed uh, and the size of the site, like if you can get the building to break apart the site, um, one exercise we did uh, Brady, you remember in Boswell's, uh, we did the um, that non finito Pandolfini. Uh -huh. um, we we were given it's like a big site. Um, it's, it's kind of a big site, but I used the building to like break apart the site into like three separate, so that there were three separate like lawns defined throughout the building. So. It's it's almost like you're using the building to 
make space uh, on the site. So the site is this, it's already this vast like parking lot, um, but you're using, it's kind of like you're using the building like ink from a pen to define new spaces on the site. Um, so, you know, you would end up with like these more intimate courtyards um, just by the way you organize your building. And that's kind of how you're already sort of doing that with the ridges of the, the blue there. Like you can see a courtyard existing in the middle of that, uh, the middle blue towards maybe the north side. Like you open up this space within the site that wasn't there before without a building. So your building shouldn't be a detriment to the site. If anything, it should add to the site and create even better exterior spaces than what's there already. I'm glad you said that because uh, so we went to when we went to go see the site, we stopped at the uh, Fort Worth Water Gardens. I don't know if you've oh, been yeah. there. Mm -hmm. But uh, something Kiesa pointed out to us as we like walked through is like around like the aerated pool, and when you're walking around it, it has like cutouts in the pathways around it, and it creates little classrooms or meeting areas. Mm -hmm. so that's kind of something that inspired the idea of the swell was to have these swells along the pathway so you can have classrooms or art exhibits or spaces to rest on the way through the site which is kind of mm -hmm. where an idea for the swell came from and beautiful the river and the swell kind of worked well yeah with those two things together. so you're already oh, sort that. of on that path i mean yeah. you set it up in a way to where you're going to have this linear or this long building that interacts with the site in a more meaningful way i think and on that note guys uh i'm about to hop off so i'm gonna do a little outro if y'all want to kick it for a while uh by all means um but i'm gonna i'm gonna do a little outro here no th this is pr probably a good point to uh wrap it up time is precious and yeah. per perfectly appreciate it and Take all the comments, take none. It's all up to you. It's your project, you know? So hopefully this helps any kind of uh, writer's block, but Brady, take it away. Yeah, so so Berkeley, thank you for presenting your project. Uh, this was a great desk crit. We had a lot of fun doing it. So thanks for showing us your work. Um, it looks great. I'm really excited to see what you present when you get to your final. I'm really excited to see the nature of where this project gets to and um, you're a great designer and even better coworker, so appreciate hey. you coming on. Well, thank you guys. It was very helpful. So good, good. Yeah, thanks yeah, for coming on, Bert. Thanks for having me. Well, sweet. Thanks, Berkeley. Thank Bye. you. Bye. See you guys. Well, giggity gang, y'all. Thanks giggity, for giggity giggity gang. So this will be, I guess, feedback, everybody. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll go there. Uh, are we and, following up later? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to follow up with him over. And Ben. Ben said he'll present. Hey, Ben called me this morning.